So Earth Species Project it seems sort of crazy to get to say this, but we're, we're working to decode non-human communication. That is to say, can we talk to animals? Um, and we get to work on this now, and it's, it's credible. And the, the goal is to say, you know, can we unlock communication to transform our relationship with the rest of nature? And I want to start with this audio. Does anyone know, who's not on our team, <laughs> what animal makes this sound? I heard krill, and which it's not, and whales, which it's not, also not beluga, also not a bird. It is, yes, seals. It's one of these guys, right? That was this guy's mating call. So, um, so if you hear that and you get excited, now you know where to go. Um, and what I love starting here is like the sounds of the natural world are so diverse, but we are mostly unaware of them. Um, Earth species, the original idea for it came uh, in 2013 um, from an NPR piece about these guys, gelata monkeys. Um, and the researcher who's on NPR talking about them said, you know, they have one of the largest vocabularies of any primate. Except for humans, they swear that the animals talk about them behind their backs, uh, which they probably are. Uh, and they sound a little bit like women and children babbling. And at the point of thinking about this, um, like there's no one really working on how do you apply machine learning to decoding an animal language. And then uh, Britt, who uh, is like the, the person that started uh, Earth Species with co-founded in 2017, when we started, there were very few people thinking about this. Um, and that's really changed uh, from 2017 to 2022. So you know, now there's this incredible book, How to Speak Well, by Tom Mustel, which sort of follows along this adventure. Um, Karen's book, which is exceptional and beautiful, um, poetic as well as scientific. And we now get to work with a whole slew of partners. And actually, I think Graham is sitting here, who's both at Internet Archive and also the Interspecies Internet. Um, and so it's gone, and then you know, slew of press. So it's gone from a, like a, an idea in the mind to something where there's an entire field that's now working on it, which is incredibly exciting. Um, and if there's one concept I want you guys to hold in the back of your minds for this, uh, for this talk is that our ability to understand is limited by our ability to perceive. And what does AI do? It is opening the aperture of human imagination and the human senses to let us perceive much more. And in so doing, it'll let us understand a whole bunch more. Karen, I think, will give a whole bunch more of these kinds of examples. But I want to start with just a couple of my favorites for opening the aperture of what we even think is possible. So University of Tel Aviv, 2019, is an incredible study on primrose flowers. And they asked this question, do you think, like nature abhors a vacuum, do you think a flower can hear the sound of an approaching bee? And so they played different sounds to a primrose flower. They played like traffic noise, uh, bat noise, and pollinator noise, bee noise. And only when they played bee noise did the flower respond. And it produced more and sweeter nectar in just a couple seconds. Right? So the flower hears the bee coming and gets excited. It's like, here, come to me. I, I think that's just amazing. And actually, they tried the inverse, same lab. They stressed out uh, tobacco and tomato plants, so dehydrated them like cut them. And it turns out they emit sound, um, and not softly. They'll emit sound in proportion to how much they are stressed at the sound of human speaking. It's just up at 50 or 60 kilohertz, so we can't hear it. And so here we go. We have plants that can hear and plants that are you know, speaking, that are emitting sound. And we were completely unaware of it until 2019. Like The world is awash in communication. And I think if we move forward and look back in time, we will be astounded at how static we thought the world was. 
just another one because I, I can't help it. There's this amazing plant called the Bochila trifiliolata. It's a, it's a vine, um, and it does the most amazing thing. You put it on other plants, and it will mimic their leaves. Pretty amazing. Um, and so biologists, uh, botanists, are like, well, wh how, how is it doing this? Well, it's probably detecting the chemical signatures of the other plants. Um, and that's how it's like knowing what leaves to make. And so they tried this great experiment in 2020 where they tried growing this vine on artificial plants. And it still was able to mimic the leaves. Right? And so, honestly, there is, this is a current mystery. The current best thought is that they use ocelleti, which is a very fancy way of saying eyes, that they are seeing the plant and changing. So again, we go forward, we look back, and we realize how little we actually knew. We're looking for animal language, because we think it's, a, one, awesome, and two, a really big lever for maybe changing human culture and driving conservation. But is there a there there? And this is a fascinating study um, from University of Hawaii in 1994, where they taught dolphins two gestures. And the first gesture was, do something you have not done before. That is, innovate. And think about it, that's a pretty complex thing to be able to communicate, because you, and to do, right? To be able to innovate, you have to remember all the things you've done before that session, understand the concept of negation, not one of those things, and then to invent something that isn't one of those things. And yet, dolphins do it. And then they teach a second gesture, do something together. And they say to the dolphins, in a pair, do something you haven't done before together. And the dolphins go down, exchange some kind of information, they come up and they do the same thing they haven't done before at the same time. And you're like, Occam's razor, it doesn't prove that there's language, but you're like, it's sort of the simplest explanation. <laughs> and that leads to the question, okay, Maybe there is a there there. How would you go about transiting a language without a Rosetta Stone? Well, if you want to understand AI, I think there's like one concept, again, to hold in your mind that's really explanatory. And that is AI turns semantic relationships into geometric relationships. This is English. This is the top 10,000 most spoken words in English. Um, it's actually supposed to be in like 300 dimensions. We projected it down to three dimensions because I can't think in 300 dimensions. Uh, every star in this galaxy is a word. And words that share a semantic relationship share a geometric relationship. So an example of this might be, you know, smelly is to malodorous as book is to tone, because malodorous is sort of the pretentious way of saying smelly. <laughs> and so if you take that, you do malodorous minus smelly, gives you pretentiousness as a relationship. You add pretentiousness to clever and illegal adroit. Um, it's, it's pretty wild to play with these spaces. And so if you think then about like, how do you end up with a shape that represents a language? If you think about a concept like dog, well, it has relationship to friend, and to guardian, and to man, and to cat, and to wolf, and to fur. And it fixes it in a point in space. And if you sort of solve the massive multidimensional Sudoku puzzle of every concept to every other concept and the relationships, out pops this rigid structure. And the question then researchers had, and why we started our species in 2017, is if you have the shape which is German and the shape which is English, they can't possibly be similar shapes, can they? And linguists would say, well, they have a different history, different cosmology, different way of relating to the world, so it should be a different shape. And yet, when the machine learners tried it, it turned out that they fit. And it wasn't just English and German which share a root, was languages like Japanese, and Esperanto, and Finnish, and Turkish, and Aramaic. And it's not like they all have the same shape, and more distant languages have more unrelated shapes. And yet, there's a way that you could align them all on top of each other. And in so doing, the point which is dog ends up in the same spot in both. I just think this is so profoundly beautiful, that you know, in a time of such a deep division, there is this hidden underlying structure that unites us all. And so our thought was, and actually, you know, this is not the way now modern, modern, I don't know what the right terms for these things are, ultra-modern machine learning does translation, but this is the core concept, I think, that holds in your head for why this thing works. And our thought was, well, can we apply this then to animal communication? If we build this shape for the way animals communicate, 
what part fits into the universal human meaning shape. And if it does, then we should be able to do tr direct translation to the human experience. And there should be some part where their experience of the world is so different, we can't translate, but we can see that there's something there. And I still don't know which one is going to be more fascinating. The parts that we can directly translate into the human experience or the parts we have no idea what it is, right? And those are going to be the things that are outside of the aperture of the human imagination, right? Whales and dolphins have cultures that, that have been passed down vocally for 34 million years. Humans, only for maximally 300,000 years. Just imagine what they might know. And why do we think there might be an overlap? Well, I'll just give two examples. This is the, uh, the mirror test. I don't know how many of you guys are aware of it, but the idea is you show an animal a mirror. Often you will like paint a uh, dot on them. And when they look in the mirror, they see themselves. They see the dot that they couldn't see before, and they try to get it off. This dolphin is looking at its abs, which I think is a relatively universal human experience when you get to a mirror. Um, but this shows a kind of self-awareness, right? Like you have to have self-awareness. That's a deep and profound experience that they may well communicate about. So that part of the shape might be shared. Let me give another example. This is a, um, a lemur uh, taking a hit off of a centipede. They do this, and they get high. They go into this trance-like state. Um, they get super happy. Uh, it turns out dolphins do the same thing, um, but with pufferfish. They will inflate a pufferfish in a group and then like pass it around to get high, um, <laughs> which is the ultimate of puff, puff, pass. Um, so elevated states of consciousness and seeking that is another thing that is shared across um, a wide variety of species. So that's something where we'd expect some kind of fit. But OK, how do we go about building this shape? And it turns out it's really hard. Getting the data is hard. That's why we have like, such a long list of partnerships. Like Ari, who's here, will talk about how hard it actually is to go out into the field. Like, this takes like, blood, sweat, and tears. Um, turns out whales don't exactly just want to like, stick around and like, help you. Um, and so you know, as we started to dive into it, we realized there, there are a lot of really, really hard problems we're going to have to solve before we could start ans asking these kinds of questions. So here, here's another question. What animal makes this sound? <laughs> Correct. You must live in San Francisco. <laughs> Anyone else want to guess? Close. That's awesome. It is about cocktail parties. That is true. This is the beluga. This is a couple belugas communicating. And to me, it sounds like an alien modem. Um, and it turns out dolphins have names that they call each other by. Uh, Valeria Vergara, Dr. Valeria, Valeria Vergara, who's doing research on belugas, is discovering that belugas also have names they call each other by, but they're broadband packets. Um, wouldn't it be nice, though, to know which beluga was speaking? You sort of want to separate them out into their own individual tracks. Valeria, for her research, had to throw away 97% of her data because the animals were overlapping, and she couldn't tell who was speaking. And like 97%, like that's like there's a next frontier there. So actually, one of our first papers was trying to tackle this particular problem. So this is. Two dogs barking, and we learned how to separate them using AI. And right now, it works on lab-like data. But where we're going is to try to get it to work more on wild data. But to do that, we're starting to work on this new trend in machine learning. You guys have heard of GPT or GPT-3 or OPT um, or CLIP or any of these sort of like new big language models. These things are foundation models. And what's really interesting about these foundation models is that in, say, understanding human language, in the last four years, is it essentially 0% of papers were using these things four years ago. And now 90% of research is based on these sort of new models. They're like the new telescope. And in the non-human domain, it's still 0%. Right? So there's this huge opportunity where there's like this novel 
catalytic technology that's also been de-risked because it works in the human domain and now it just has to be brought to the non-human domain. And so that's sort of really our roadmap right now is that we are working with all of our partners, collecting data, aggregating data, building these foundational models and the benchmarks that are required to know whether you're getting better so we can build these kinds of semantic representations um, to understand uh, language, the shapes of language and the things that I haven't talked about but are sort of next to them so that we can work on these kinds of translations and eventually get to communicate. So we actually just published um, the 21st of October our first big paper on building a benchmark so that you can tell across many different tasks how well these models are doing, which really paves the way for the next paper, which will be out uh, in the next, I think, couple of weeks, on our first sort of foundation models. OK. So I've talked about the ability to translate between human languages, um, but maybe that just works because we all share the same you know, anatomy, physiology. Um, but actually, there's something deeper going on. So I want to talk a little bit about multimodal translation. Um, have you guys seen like all of the AI generative art that's been happening recently? How does that work? Dolly, exactly. Um, here's how to think about it. So you can build the shape for a language, but you can also build a shape for images, because it's just the relationship between things. You then look over the internet to find all of the images and captioned pairs, and that learns to associate languages and images. And so now I can say something like portrait of Chile as a person, find the point in language space, translate it over to the point in image space, and say, computer, generate me the image that goes there. There's a real example. So I'll just give one example here, Google Soup. Ask the AI to generate the image that goes with Google Soup. And what's really cool about this, right, is like there's a deep amount of semantic understanding. It knows enough to get the Google mascot, fine. It knows that soup is hot and plastic melts in soup. So the mascot is melting. And then there's this incredible visual pun of the yellow of the mascot is also the yellow of corn. Right? There's a lot that it knows. This was my face when I first saw this. <laughs> and so, OK, so this is multimodal translation. You can translate between two very different sense modalities. And this makes us believe that this kind of thing can work across species as well. So what kind of data do we work with? This is actually Ari. Um, in Antarctica, uh, tagging whales. And you can see that the data that comes off of it is uh, how the animals move, kinematics. You get visuals, so you get video, and you get audio. So you can start to translate between these. Um, one of, we actually uh, just were awarded one of the National Geographic Explorers <laughs> Awards. And um, the project is led by Benjamin Hoffman, who is working on turning all of that like physical motion data into meaning. Like, what are, what are their behaviors? How do you categorize it? And the reason why I want to do that, um, in part, is because this lets you start doing really interesting things. Like, say, OK, given this motion, what sound goes with it? So you could imagine saying, we have two elephants coming together. You model that, and you say, AI, generate me the audio. That is the sound of two uh, elephants coming together. And that'll give you the, the affiliate calls, the contact calls, how they say their name. Um, or you might say, OK, we want to like, intervene with ship strikes hitting whales. Could it be possible to say to a whale, like, dive? And we would then say, what would you say to have a whale dive? And we'll generate the audio for that. Now, before saying that, like, ooh, we should just go do that, it comes with a lot of really complex ethical issues. Are we forcing the animal to dive, and it's missing food or expending energy that it can't afford? Um, it's just like one of the kinds of things that, that we might run into there. Um, so, and this is sort of the area that I'm really interested in exploring today. Um, I just want to show one more video, and this is with another partner of ours, Michelle Fournay. Uh, this is from her very recent documentary uh, called Fathom on Apple Television about her experiments that we're starting to work with her on. Oldest cultures are not human. They're from the ocean. 40 million years ago, before we walked upright, before we sparked fire, whales evolved to build relationships in the dark. I'm trying to start a conversation is the most basic way you can say it. 
I am trying to put a speaker in the ocean and talk to the whale and hope it talks back. Party playback. If this work is successful, it will be the first experiment where we have engaged in a dialogue with a humpback whale. The punchline um, is that it works. She's saying hello to the whales, which sounds like whoop. Um, and it also apparently encodes their name. And they respond back. The next question is, can we say something more complex than just recording something and playing it back? So one of our researchers, uh, Jen Yu, has been working on building language models directly on top of audio. Um, and so this is an example of that. This is a humpback contact call that hello, maybe with name, a real one, and then two synthetic ones. So we're just at the beginning of this. Um, and a technology that came out in the last essentially month um, is, and this one comes from Google, um, who's actually donating a whole, a whole bunch of compute to be able to build these kinds of models to Earth species. But this is an audio language model. And here, you're going to see the demo of being given just three seconds of anyone's voice. And it can then continue that voice with the same prosody, the same diction, um, the same semantics. And then it'll do the same thing with a piano. So here's an example. First impressions of people are, in nine cases out of ten, mere spectacle reflections of the actuality Prompt. of things. Prompt. Made up. But they are impressions of something different and more. Right? Or how about piano? Prompt. Made up. So what does this mean? This means in our domain, at some point, 12, 24, 36 months, we're going to be able to do this for animal vocalizations. Right? And so just like I can build a chatbot in Chinese without needing to understand Chinese that still convince a Chinese speaker, we will likely, we haven't done it yet, be able to sort of pass the dolphin Turing test or the whale Turing test or the tool using crow Turing test. And it's really exciting because that means there is a kind of first contact or, or something that's about to happen but not in the way I think we originally expected, where we decode first and then begin to communicate. But there will be this really surprising ability to communicate before we understand. And so obviously, there are some deep ethical issues here, as well as some really exciting opportunities. So one of our partners, Christian Roots, um, who works with Two Using Crows, sort of commented um, on a roadmap and said, hey, you know, humpback whales, their song, it can go viral. Um, so a song sung off the coast of Australia might get picked up and sung you know, within a year across much of the population. Um, so if we're not careful, we may have just invented like a CRISPR of culture and messed up a, or intervened in a 34 million year old culture. And so I think now is the right time to start thinking about when you invent a new technology, you invent a new responsibility. Like, What are the responsibilities for acting with a duty of care for the natural world? And in some ways, that's the whole point of Earth Species in the first place, is how do we shift our relationship with the rest of nature? So I think it's a really exciting time to have this kind of conversation because you know, I, I think we think of AI as the invention of modern optics. It's like the telescope, in the sense that before, when we invented the telescope, we looked out into the universe and discovered Earth was not the center. And here, the opportunity that we get to look out at the patterns of the universe and discover that maybe humanity is not the center of the universe.